there, started screen sharing. There we go. I think we can make that's it. So can I just check colleagues can see that, can they? The uh, yeah. Um, and that's uh, yes, international. Yes, yes. Okay, international. That's a view of London from uh, not quite our office um, in uh, Canary Wharf in London, but it's a good view. Um, so we're looking here at a, uh, an environmental uh, sustainability management accounting template. And in the interest of time, I haven't put all the references in, but we it's in the paper. Uh, but we've done uh, we've done a literature uh, review going back some time um, as we try and trace the journey to see where it's taking us um, uh, in the future. And um, I'm just uh, pressing my button here if that's going to work. It doesn't seem to want to be moving on. There we go. So I just thought um, Im important to understand uh, for, for, for our colleagues in the audience, you know, what, what is EMA, uh, Environmental Management Accounting? Well, one of the references I've got here, uh, Burit, Burit et al., um, it's about helping managers make better decisions uh, about looking at the, um, the environmental impacts um, of an organization beyond its boundaries about uh, uh, what happens to it and also the, how that influences the organization, um, includes uh, economic drivers. Sorry, did, some, did somebody say something? I thought, oh no, I thought somebody was saying, Alan, this is so awful, shut up. No, we're okay, fine. Um, so it includes uh, economic drivers and the various consequences. Um, and then uh, making those links. And I think if we're talking about commercial organization, organizations, they do, they do have to be connections with uh, the economic drivers and the economic consequences. Um, if we continue with the drivers, well, first of all, in a generic sense, if we look at the idea of corporate social responsibility, and we heard references to these uh, earlier on in the opening uh, addresses, if you look at how the, um, it's not just evolution, but there's been an accelerated evolution of the, uh, the scope, uh, the pace, and the significance of CI CSR matters. Um, and what I'm increasingly seeing in the accounting and finance literature uh, uh, in, the con in the context of this is ESG, the Economic, Social and Governance Matters. Now, uh, that's a generic uh, driver. Um, uh, a more specific one, if we go back to November last year, uh, COP26 held in Glasgow uh, in Scotland, um, uh, there were two things which came, many things came out of that, but two in the context of this, we heard reference earlier on to human rights and, and so on, uh, a continued commitment to human rights in, in both the broadest and very specific um, uh, subsections. Um, and but specifically, um, something that we're interested to hear is that strengthening those emission reduction targets by 2030 and uh, aspiring uh, to net zero emissions by 2050, um, with many nations signing up to that and others giving uh, commitments, uh, broad commitments uh, around that uh, arena. So um, let's have a quick look at an EMA uh, summary timeline. And I think, Lindsay, uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, share something here uh, with us on a timeline because we couldn't fit it in on a conventional PowerPoint uh, slide. So I think there's a Prezi presentation which is about to uh, enter into the uh, into the fray now, Lindsay. There we go. Thank you for that, Lindsay. Um, so uh, we went back in our in our search uh, uh, to uh, the 1980s as the start, and there were the, these these general references uh, to su uh, sustainability. Um, and one of the first ones we found out which had any links at all with um, accounting was the International Union for Conservation of Nature, where they were saying, "Look, you've got to now start to think about non-financial reporting um, issues." Um, then there was the Brundtland uh, report, re uh, report for, um, sponsored by the WCED um, back in 1987, which um, uh, again emphasised this need to, to have non-financial reporting uh, figures. Uh, the Global Reporting Initiative was set up in 1997. I've called it G uh, we called it GR. I one because that was the first um, one which came out. We said you need to be looking at different things and it's not just all about financial stuff. Um, they came out with another update in 1999, again, expanding the scope. Um, and um, interestingly, in 2001, uh, following from the United Nations Division on uh, Sustainable Development coming out of the commission, um, uh, um, a colleague called Jash uh, uh, issued um, uh, environmental management accounting principles and procedure, uh, procedures and principles, which was really quite significant because of the first time, and I'll give you some reference, I'll give you an insight to this shortly, um, uh, it, uh, uh, it captured for the first time 
uh, really what the scope should be. And then just looking at the timeline again, uh, the International uh, Federation of Accountants uh, came up with guidelines uh, in 2005. Uh, in 2006, we had the Un United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, um, G Global Reporting Initiative. More stuff came out in 2009. In 2011, um, you had the Sustainable Accounting uh, Standards Board uh, uh, coming together, issuing um, uh, guidance. Now, this one's just interesting. If I linger on this for a moment, uh, 2015, um, the uh, task force headed up by Michael Bloomberg, and some of you will be f familiar with Bloomberg in the context of finance, um, task force on climate related financial disclosure with lots and lots of um, um, investment funds signing up to this uh, and uh, making it part and parcel of, well, if you're going to be involved in this, you have to commit to certain uh, principles. Um, Global Reporting Initiative, again, in 2016, more came out of that. And then uh, following on from COP, which was interesting, uh, there were already moves towards it, but uh, time to uh, appear at the same time, the International Sustainability Standards uh, Board emerged there. So we have a timeline there. So thank you for that, uh, Lindsay. And if we could just move back into the uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, slides, and I'll take you through to one or two other things. And while that's coming up, at the end, what we're looking for, this is really a work in progress on our part. We'll be looking, hopefully, to you to say what the next steps will be, because we're not too sure what the next steps should be. Um, so um, if we look at the evolution, um, uh, back in the 1990s, it was really about um, internal accounting. That's all it was. Envi and this was a major issue uh, in terms of information that wasn't available because environmental and non-environmental costs seem to be grouped together under overheads. And uh, overheads, their expenses, hey, let's just write them off. So it was very much on an accounting reporting uh, basis in terms of what went into the income and expenditure account, the profit uh, calculations. And things just disappear. There's a lot of evidence of, uh, of that. Um, then uh, I mentioned uh, Yash, and here, uh, 2001, that first uh, really trying to grab hold of what the scope should be, said, okay, look, let's let's have physical accounting. We have to have physical accounting to be able to monitor things, but also those monetary ones. And that was a major step in the right direction. It wasn't, hadn't really been articulated and reflected uh, like that before. Um, and then, then something I'm particularly interested in is in addition to academic qualifications, me personally, I'm a, I'm a qualified accountant as well. So CGMA, um, Chartered Global Management Accounting uh, body, which is made up of uh, SEMA and AICPA, um, they started to uh, that they came out with some really um, quite quite strong guidelines about what should be looked at the the costs of environment uh, environment related activities, uh, looking at reductions, having formal measures uh, for those, um, and then actually making sure that in the uh, net present value and other uh, techniques which are used in capital investment decisions, investment appraisal, actually making sure that um, almost as a standard uh, that within the template environmental considerations are there um, and then uh, saying okay you've now got to have routine performance monitoring you know and it's interesting a number of organizations didn't have that and many still don't and then also benchmarking activities and within that um, uh, uh, looking at um, it's not moving on I don't know why it's not moving on I don't know Lindsay there we, it's moved on it's taken its time looking at both prevention costs um, and appraisal costs, but then adding to that um, the internal failure costs, the, you know, the costs of eliminating environmental impacts that have been created by the organization. Just going off at a tangent, talking to a colleague a few weeks ago about this, um, uh, the colleague, I hadn't come across it, uh, is now talking about extinction accounting, about the impact on wildlife around the world. And there's, there seems to be a whole move there as well. Um, so is a EMA working? Uh, so we've, we've condensed this for the time that's available. Um, looking at the literature, there, there certainly seem to be mixed results. There seem to be a combination of very sort of broad brush approaches and then ad hoc initiatives um, within organizations. And you get some parts of organizations where people are really keen on things, other organizations where they're perhaps not so keen or enthusiastic. And there seems to be this lack of joined up handwriting and almost silo mentalities. And of course, the argument would be that if you're really to take this forward, you need to be doing it with an organizational momentum rather than just individual um, ad hoc uh, initiatives. The, research, uh, the literature we looked at seemed to be strongly indicating that um, 
technology limitations uh, were getting in the way, um, because of course, if you're going to have a completely uh, uh, updated, uh, enhanced um, financial, uh, financial and non-financial reporting system, you need to have, you need to re revamp your systems. And of course that, that takes money as well. Now, uh, time lags, uh, the information is, is it's, it's really important that you get it timely. Oh, that's, not, that's not happening. And uh, just almost there at the end, uh, what we're also seeing is what's being referred to as greenwashing, where organizations are doing some things, but then they're, 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 um, they're, they're, they're really enhancing it in their presentation to uh, perhaps emphasize things that they're not really doing, but it makes their credentials look good. And interestingly, uh, brownwashing, where they're doing things but they're minimizing the publication of the results because they're worried that some investors might be saying, oh, you're spending so much money on all this stuff. Um, what, what's the impact on, for example, our earnings per share and the, and the value of our business? And so they're downplaying the achievements that they've actually got. And that, that was quite interesting. I hadn't come across that uh, before. Uh, so next steps. Um, we know that with the fourth industrial revolution uh, that's here, that the emphasis there on data, I've seen a, I've seen a, a reference in another piece of work that we looked at, uh, that uh, data is the new economic moat, you know, and organizations which uh, have got data will get strength uh, from that. Um, and that could, I said about de technology, that could be the platform uh, for architecture, for developing new technology and reporting systems on carbon emissions, water usage, land usage, uh, pollution, both individually, but blended. Otherwise, this 2050 target, I mean, all the evidence is that it's not going to work unless organizations, commercial organizations, charitable organizations, governmental organizations are at the forefront. So some next steps um, with that, um, uh, going off, uh, looking at what it is that people, uh, that organizations are doing, um, that in itself is a huge task. And we were thinking, I, I took you through the CGMA, the global, um, so the Chartered Global Management Accountant template, which is um, quite comprehensive, and perhaps going off to organizations and saying, look, here's one template that's being used, um, being recommended by a major professional accountancy body. You know, are you, are you doing any of that? Uh, and seeing if there's not compliance, because there's, there's no law which says you have to use that template, but to what degree they map onto that, and what are the other things they're doing? And if anybody can give us any advice, we'd be really grateful. So I'll stop there because I know that uh, in the interest of time, we, uh, uh, we have to stop. And Lindsay, thank you for, for doing that, uh, particularly with Prezi. I've never got my head around Prezi, but there you go. We, uh, I'm sure it will come to me.